you for joining us. I'm Bruce Sprague, uh, Western Canadian Tax Leader and Partner in our Vancouver office. I will be the host for today's exciting session. I'm delighted to have uh, Lauro, Dan and Hedl with us. Um, today we have Lauro Ferroni from JLL who will provide us with a 15 minute overview of the US market. Uh, this is exciting and very topical at this point in time. Lauro is a senior director in the firm's real estate capital markets research platform. Uh, his responsibilities include uh, leading JLL's capital markets research report suite, uh, monitoring key industry indicators and developing custom analytics uh, to inform their client strategies and help position the firm as a thought leader. Um, something that's very relevant to our real estate uh, uh, clients and uh, the real estate community here in Canada. Um, we are delighted to have Laurel with us today as part of our video universe. And Laurel, without further ado, um, I'll pass the stage over to you for your presentation and, and thank you once again. Bruce, thanks for the introduction. I will share our slide content. All right, so I'll spend a few moments talking to you about the US real estate capital markets, where we are today and what we are seeing. So I'd like to start by covering some of the features of the economic landscape. Obviously, we've had a very abrupt halt to activity. And because of that, so much of the economic data right now is very unusual and it's hard to interpret. And definitely right now, any sort of forecasts are quite difficult to do. I would say that in the US, we've been benefiting from a whatever it takes Fed policy, right, with a lot of um, liquidity and stability being injected into the system. At the same time, we've also seen the largest fiscal stimulus package, um, but there are significant risks right now with inactivity of more. Um, and if that does not come, that is likely to dampen the recovery. Now, over the past months, um, certainly the election cycle has very much been on investors' radar and has been impacting sentiment. What I would say overall is that our view is that policy certainly matters at the margin, but there really isn't a statistical, a strong statistical relationship about any one political party driving, you know, notably stronger economic growth or stronger stock market performance. Certainly policies related to taxes and infrastructure and foreign policy and healthcare and immigration will influence investor sentiment. Um, but again, there's not kind of a significant impact either way is our opinion. And what I think is really notable to say at the moment is that the virus and the path of the virus, the path of the pandemic is really what's gonna be determining the length and the severity of the economic downturn. So with a bit of that table setting as to the economy, I wanna jump right into the capital markets environment. Showing here on our screen is US transactions activity going through the past couple of cycles. And you can see, of course, how abrupt the decrease was in the first three quarters of this year. What I will say, though, is we are now in recovery mode. So the third quarter saw improvement on the second quarter in terms of activity. Of course, the third quarter was still down on the third quarter of last year. But if you look at Q3 of this year over Q2 of this year, we were up 31%. So that really shows that in an incredibly compressed time frame, we fell from the top of the market all the way to the bottom and have now already started recovering from there. Another indicator that we like to look at is what are we as a company um, for transactions that we are working on going under contract on week over week. And we've indexed this on the right hand side of the slide. And you can again see that trough around the May or June timeframe with activity increasing since then. And we think this will be a leading indicator for more closed transactions in the fourth quarter of this year. A big theme in the market at the moment is the divergence of what's going on, right? The theme of the haves and the have nots. 
Um, to get a bit of a sentiment on uh, what investors are thinking, we looked at public market values for all the U.S. real estate investment trusts by sector. And you can really see on the left-hand side, the ones that are outperforming, <laughs> such as data centers, self-storage, and industrial. And then way off to the right, as you would expect, you have the retail sector, you have hotels, you have shopping centers, and regional malls. The bars in red show how much these REIT share prices declined at the depths of the lockdowns in late March. And then the gray bar is where we are today. So what's kind of remarkable about these sectors on the left-hand side is there has been a significant amount of recovery. So not only are they doing better as a whole, there's been a lot of recovery. If you look to the right of the screen, the story is really not great, right? Retail has fallen a lot and has not moved much from that low point. Same thing with lodging and shopping centers. With that said, though, I certainly want to emphasize the point that those declines that we're seeing in the public markets certainly is not indicative of what real estate as a whole is seeing from a, from a decline standpoint. And we've seen in previous downturns that the public markets certainly tend to overshoot the private markets. And you see that experience here also so far in 2020 with subsequently a little bit of a correction going on there with the public markets. Now, a big theme that has really come into focus so far this year and has actually been accelerated because of the pandemic is investors' focus on defensive sectors and asset classes that are really in the path of growth. And if you look at the top of the last cycle, or I guess two cycles ago from 2015, 2005 to 2007, sectors to include industrial, multifamily, and alternatives were just under 40% of annual direct transaction volumes in the US. So far this year, that number has gone up to 65%. So it's very much telling that story of investors moving into new sectors where they either believe they can get more yield or where the growth prospects are more compelling. Continuing here with a bit of a rapid fire presentation, looking at where we've seen the most amount of transactions volume in the US so far this year, with again, the overall market being down 40%. What you see here with the percent declines on the right hand side is really that every market has seen a decrease, right? There aren't just a handful of markets that are doing poorly when others are seeing growth. Everybody is seeing a decline. But you look at some standouts here, Raleigh, Durham, right? Very much a Sunbelt growth market story. A lot of life sciences activity has been propping up investment volumes. Year to date, they're down 14%. That's a lot less than other sectors. On the flip side of that, Seattle, is down 71% year over year. Um, Seattle saw an exceptionally strong 2019 with some tech um, leased assets transacting and has now seen a, a decline somewhat significantly. Dallas is really moving up in the ranks. Right in 2019, Dallas was the fifth most active city for transactions in the US and Dallas is now in the second position. What is underpinning some of the activity that we're seeing is the debt markets. So, so marking such a difference from the last downturn, the debt markets in the US are very strong and they are ready to underpin some of the transactions activity that is actually taking place. So we are certainly not in a financially driven downturn. It's a very different story. And an important theme here from this depiction is we are going into this downturn with a much more diversified composition of lenders having been active recently. So in 2007, over half of the activity in the US was driven by commercial mortgage backed securities um, loans. And now in 2019, you see that more diversified composition. What really has been driving activity in the second quarter, and that's the most recent quarter for which we have this 
data is you see here the government agencies, this dark gray bar here that is about 40% of the activity lending to the multi-housing space. And you also see here off to the right that transactions activity is down by more than loan volumes have slowed. And that's um, again, indicative of the strong market for refinance activity at the moment. So with some of those real time indicators covered about how the market is performing, I wanna talk about three themes that we think very much still hold true and that are gonna be driving activity in the US market going forward. A big story over the past 10 years has been the relative outperformance of non-gateway markets, right? It's markets in the Southeast and the Sun Belt, markets in Texas, and to an extent, some of the non-coastal West Coast markets. That's where the economic growth has been taking place, where the job growth and where the employment and the population growth has been. Um, very notable example in the U.S., of course, is Austin, Texas, or Dallas, Fort Worth, Nashville on this slide as well. New York and Boston, right way off to the left-hand side. Chicago not even plotted on here, so a more negative story there in relative terms. Now, what, so the big question is, right, is this trend going to uphold itself with the pandemic and kind of the new world in which we're operating? And it is our opinion that it very much will and recent indicators that we're looking at from sources like Redfin or Zillow or U-Haul truck rental prices between city pairs and then you know it being a lot cheaper if you do it on the reverse because no one is moving in that direction looking at mail forwarding either temporary or permanent from the postal service this theme seems to be upholding itself now where we have less of a clear picture is what is going to be the longer term impact for central business districts versus the suburbs and the, the sort of decade long theme of urbanization does look like it's halted in its tracks right now and but there is not enough data to suggest right that there really is a secular reversal of that trend so we're really devouring any type of data points to try to come to an answer on that question what we're looking at currently is how are urban rental apartments doing versus suburban ones? And there is kind of a strong picture here, right? That the ones in the suburbs are holding up a lot better, even seeing a little bit of growth, whereas urban markets are down. But some of it is also because that's where we've seen the higher supply pipeline. So it is not necessarily all migration driven. What's also interesting at the moment is multi-housing apartments, rental apartments that are larger than 1,000 square feet per unit are actually outperforming the smaller ones in terms of a bit more of a positive um, landscape of fundamentals. So I would say here, this is something we as a company are watching very closely, but the jury is still out and it's too early to make a definitive decision to say that urbanization is dead and that we're only gonna be talking about a flight from density. So with that um, geographic and, and demographic theme, I wanna to touch on what we're seeing and tracking with regard to the investment managers. And really the story here is that the big are getting bigger and they are expanding strategies to be able to attract more capital. This is especially relevant for um, some of the institutional investors and pension funds based in Canada who are partnering up with investment managers to then deploy that capital. And while investors really have more choice than ever before, we're actually right now seeing a strong preference that those investors are actually wanting to work with fewer managers. So you see here at this point this year, three quarters of those groups surveyed said they really just want to go with one manager. They want someone who has a track record through the downturn. And it's really hard at the moment to do due diligence with new managers, right? Because that necessitates travel and things that are difficult at this time. So because of that, the mega funds are continuing to grow in prevalence. 
and also the average fund size, even though fundraising is down as a whole, the average fund size has continued to grow. And in terms of where the investor sentiment is at the moment, it's really taking shape of a barbell. So by that, we mean we're seeing on the one hand of the spectrum of flights to quality. So there's a greater share of investors now who are bidding on core, core plus transactions, right? The prevalence of value add deals has gone down this year because of less conviction to underwrite rent growth. And if you look specifically on the right hand side here with regard to new funds being formed, there's a somewhat significant increase in funds with an opportunistic strategy. Um, an example here would be the Starwood distressed property fund right now with just under $6 billion raised, including a commitment from Texas County. It's going to be targeting distressed or assets with an opportunistic profile in the U.S. and in Europe. Now, leaving you with one more theme, which of course has been changing quite a bit as it relates to cross-border capital. Now, what is very much still holding true in our opinion is the growth in allocations to the real estate sector as a whole. Even through the pandemic, we're actually hearing that investors are wanting to put even more money in real estate. So we don't think that there's a reversal of this long-term trend. Um, some of the research in the space right, says that institutional investors are targeting between an 11 to, to, to sort of around the 11% allocation to real estate. And you look in the US just how much that institutional investment has been increasing over the last couple of years versus the peak of the previous cycle and industrial has seen almost a 100% increase in institutional capital. Um, similar number for alternatives. Office, on the other hand, has actually gone down because of the theme we, we spoke about before. Multi-housing kind of in the middle there and retail, again, also not particularly in favor at the moment. Now, shifting to the cross-border story, in the U.S., we do have the benefit of a significant amount of capital coming in from Canada targeting commercial real estate. And there have been some cycl cyclical and also secular trends here. Um, in the previous cycle up until 2007, the Canadian proportion of total cross-border capital was around 20%, about $4 billion a year. That has now gone up to about $19 billion per year on average, or about 34% of the overall piece of the pie. Now, while capital, cross-border capital, of course, has slowed significantly so far this year because of barriers on travel, making it more difficult to inspect buildings. There are a lot of reasons why we do think this is a temporary slowdown, and we're already starting to see some awakening of groups, especially those that have boots on the ground in the U.S. who are again looking at assets and doing due diligence. And some of the drivers for that are the fact that some investors want to access the U.S. because of more lofty valuations in um, the home market, right? If you think about how low um, prime office yields are, for instance, in some of the top Canadian cities, um, the U.S. offers more opportunities for scale. It, it provides a diversification opportunity. We have active debt markets, liquid capital markets, and overall a transparent market. So that's a bit of an overview of the key themes we're seeing in the market today and a bit of our view for the next uh, months ahead. So Bruce, I will turn it back to you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Laurel. That was a, uh, a fantastic overview for, for, for me and for us and for certainly everybody that's enjoying this, uh, this session. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, I stop and pause on some of the slides that you shared as far as what, I, what caught my attention in any event were, was that one slide that captured the landscape of growth. I'm just looking at my notes, growth shifting to the non-gateway markets. I thought that was interesting as well as the proportion of Canadian um, investment at 34% into the U.S. in the last little while. And, and you don't see that as abating, which is a nice segue as I'm staring at Dan Lundenberg's picture. 
of uh, the next conversation that I'm going to have with uh, with Dan and Heddle. Uh, so again, thank you very much, Laurel. That was uh, a great overview. So we're now going to move into our um, our tax discussion. We've um, I, I'm privileged to be working with Dan Lundenberg and Heddle uh, Kotesha. Uh, Dan leads our U.S. tax practice uh, within BDO in Canada. Uh, Dan's quite familiar on structuring Canadian investment in the United States, uh, done so for quite some time. We won't give the actual numbers, but he's been doing it for a while, more than two years. And, and Heddle, uh, a distinguished practitioner recently presented at the Canadian Tax Foundation, does a lot of both, I guess, inbound, inbound and outbound structuring. Uh, always nice to have uh, Heddle with us as well. Um, the two of them, Dan and Heddle, we won't have any shortage of conversation, and so it should be a, a great session here. And I guess to bookend uh, our, our conversation on uh, tax issues, it's not lost on anyone who's enjoying today's session, the fact that we just had a, um, a federal election. It remains to be seen what uh, how that <clears throat> comes together on uh, the 3rd. Um, but we've also recently had our BC provincial election. We've had an election in Sas uh, Saskatchewan in Canada as well. As you know, we missed our federal budget this past year in 2020, which means maybe there's some um, suppressed, uh, you know, enthusiasm by our federal government on legislative change that could happen in 2021. So there's a lot of things that we could otherwise be thinking about as we uh, get into this conversation on uh, tax issues. Adel, I'm going to start with you. Um, are, are you aware, what do you see on the horizon as far as Canadian, potential Canadian legislative changes uh, that may impact cross-border real estate flow? You know, particularly when we think of what Laurel just shared with us that uh, Canada has, and if we look at certainly our Vancouver uh, real estate uh, client base, a lot of them have interests in um, in that U.S., market. So uh, how might uh, you know, legislative change sort of impact some of their decisions? Well, first of all, it's really very nice to be here this uh, today and, and thanks for the opportunity to speak in front of this audience. So I think there's a couple of things I want to bring to uh, people's attention. Uh, one of the things that's been talked about a lot is potential interest uh, reforming our interest limitation rules. So many people may be aware that uh, it currently permits interest deductions based on a fixed asset ratio test of you know, really 60% uh, debt, 40% equity, and it's a fixed ratio test. One of the things that Canada is considering, and this was sort of discussed in the Liberal Minority Government platform, is going to an uh, interest uh, limitation test based on an uh, income statement test. So basically limiting the deductibility of interest based on, uh, I guess, uh, EBITDA, like an EBITDA type, type test and an income statement test. And so you have to think that, you know, with the real estate industry, very capital intensive, a lot of leverage on their balance sheet and things like that. How are they going to deal with certain industries or certain sectors? And, you know, could they give some limitations or restrictions based on certain types of industry? That's one thing that we see. Uh, the other, I would say, significant change is we've all heard, you know, governments are looking for tax revenues. And so, you know, what are they going to do in terms of uh, capital gains uh, taxation in Canada? So one of the things that's been widely discussed is right now in Canada, capital gains are taxed at a 50% inclusion rate. And, you know, is that rate going to go up? Uh, you know, and to maybe let's say three quarters or something, something different. And so people have been speculating about this for the last couple of years, whether that's something that actually comes to fruition is yet to be seen. We haven't had a budget yet because the government's busy responding to COVID restrictions. And I think the other theme in terms of, you know, raising tax revenue is potential wealth taxes they, they, they've discussed, right? So whether there's an, a wealth tax that's introduced on, 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 on capital and things like that, those are some of the trends that we're seeing in, in Canada. Yeah, th thanks very much, Edel. You know, if I can sort of, you know, dive into a couple of them just to get your, your thoughts. Like interest deductibility seems to me has been on the radar of the Department of Finance for some time. Do you think it's now that they start to look a little more closely at uh, implementing a, a measure? Because it, it feels like with that, as well as um, the same maybe applies to capital gain inclusion rate. Uh, we as practitioners, as you know, every year it's almost like flipping a coin. Oh yeah, we're talking about it. In fact, I just responded um, to a client on that very note. Do you think it'll happen, Bruce? So if you're a betting man, what, what are you thinking as far as these types of changes? Yeah, I think thing with Canada is we're sort of like, I think of us as a small uh, fish in a big ocean a little bit, but I think some of the changes on interest really are driven by the BEPS measures and the OECD yeah. initiatives. 
And so I think that Canada's lines and rules are a little bit out of line with other developed countries. And I think on the interest limitation rules, I do see Canada's movement on, on that front. Uh, that's one thing that I, I do see that there be whether that actually raises more tax revenues it's yet to be determined but i do right. see some shifting and more in line with global policies uh so that's definitely i think the area in terms of capital gains uh my own personal feeling is that they're not going to increase capital gains inclusion rates that's the, if i was a betting person i think there's a need to attract capital and uh, build uh build uh you know people's portfolio and and, and encourage investment this is probably not the right time to either increase corporate rates in canada which i don't think is going to occur or to raise capital gains inclusion rates. That's just my personal feeling. Yeah, very good point, Hill. Yeah, I mean, yeah, interesting perspectives. Um, I know that they're shared, um, but uh, yeah, certainly lots of our clients are thinking about both issues as they uh, path plan forward, given we're already November 5th, the calendar year is quickly escaping us. And I've heard we may see a fall economic statement yet. Uh, it was taught to be October, but seems like it keeps getting pushed back based on other uh, issues. Now, Dan, maybe I'll turn to you. It's not like you're getting off scot-free here. The um, uh, U.S. measures like the 1031 exchange rate, right, which my understanding, and certainly you will correct me if I'm wrong, uh, provide for an exchange of, uh, of real property on a, on a transaction. And that's something that, um, say for some of our Canadian real estate developers that are looking at U.S., they, you know, when they're competing for projects, they may be coming up against uh, sort of their U.S. counterparts that are able to avail themselves of these measures, and maybe they can, um, you know, bid more effectively. Is that what are you seeing around that measure being like? First off, maybe just take uh, you know our, our listeners through how that works, and maybe whether this is in fact, um, again, fact or fiction. Well, thanks, Bruce, uh, and thanks everyone for uh, the glad to be able to uh, participate in this uh, in this conference. Uh, 1031s are, are like-kind exchanges. The, the notion is that if you exchange one property for another, it's it's inappropriate to levy a tax on that exchange because you're just substituting one investment for another. It's similar to the, the theory behind our sort of our tax-free reorganization rules. When you're not liquidating an investment, is it appropriate to levy a tax? And so what's happened in the U.S. is that there is there is there's a huge industry built up in facilitating the exchange of one real property for another. And so you have you know, many real U.S. real estate investors owning significantly valuable real property with essentially a, a no cost basis or nil cost base um, because they've been able to exchange one for another over a period of years. Now, 1031 transactions have been under attack for many years, in fact, with uh, the most recent tax reform um, that Trump passed a few years ago, 1031s were limited to just real estate. So previously, you were able to use 1031 exchanges uh, for non-real estate. So now it's just uh, you know ju just for real estate. And the question is that you know in in looking for revenue going forward, particularly in a scenario where you had sort of a, a democratic sweep, would that be on the table? Because Previous Democratic administrations were looking to repeal 1031. Now, of course, the election results are still pending, um, and you know. But one thing is clear: there will not be a Democratic sweep, um, and so we won't know what, what's going to happen in the Senate probably until January. But it's very likely that we're going to have divided government. Uh, the real estate lobby is strong. Uh, obviously, if, if Trump is reelected, the real estate lobby will be stronger. Um, but you know, the, the real estate lobby has been very protective over over keeping that that 1031 benefit. Um, you know, the flip side is, you know, when you know what it does is it allows U.S. investors, you know, to invest without the without a tax consequence. They're you know, it's it's they're not dealing with post tax dollars, dealing with pre tax dollars, and so certainly that's been a disadvantage to to you know to some part of the Canadian market. You know, there is a, a part of the Canadian market that 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 has tax exempt money coming in. And so maybe in that case, it's sort of an even playing field. Yeah, no, th thank you very much for that, uh, Dan, and great perspective. While we're on that theme about what we may expect on uh, any legislative change that might 
come uh, you know from around the corner um, any thoughts from you or head on, on that particular point because um, just uh, I guess obviously speculation but we've uh, you know we have had and I think Heddle you've seen where some of our Canadian corporations have looked at uh, moving to the US you know at, at points in time for you know corporate rate reasons uh, etc but you, what what do you what might we be seeing in the next little while as far as uh, they call it the playing field? Well, I mean, the, the Biden plan was on the corporate tax side to increase the corporate tax rate from 20% to 28%. Um, I've been in Canada 24 years, so I've been in the U.S. Canadian market that long. Um, you know, and when I came here, U.S. corporate tax rates were, you know, 35% was the top rate. When you add state tax on top of it, you were at sort of in the low 40s. Um, Canada went through a period of tax rate reduction um, that, you know, that, that, gave a significant tax rate differential. That tax rate differential went away effectively when U.S. rates went down to 21%. So when you added state rate, you, you were sort of at tax rate parity. You know, Biden's plan was to go raise 21 to 28%, and then you would have introducing a, a differential again because you'd have an effective rate, depending, of course, what state you're in, in the 30s. Now, of course, you know, in a scenario where where there's no democratic, you know, control of both the, the presidency and, and, and the Senate, it's going to be very difficult to imagine that that 21 will go up to 28 percent. Will it go up a point or two because each point generates a significant amount of, of, of revenue? You know, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be very tough to have any kind of meaningful tax reform going forward in, in divided government. So the, the, the forecast for tax increases just went down very significantly over the last 48 hours, and that's likely to be the case regardless of, of the election results. Yeah, uh, I'd like to add a couple of comments on, on that. Uh, I guess we all know that the headline tax rate doesn't really tell the true story, right? We know there's, a, there's the, the statutory rate and there's the effective rate. And one of the themes that I see building in, in, the, in the coming year is the OECD, OECD reform on on, uh, on uh, digital tax. But as part of those digital tax reforms, there's, call for, there's calls for a global minimum tax. And then one of the things that Biden has mentioned in his proposal is a, is a 15 percent minimum global tax. And this is not in, uh, in line with other countries that are also considering this. So even though there may not be uh, increasing tax rates or whatever, there's considerable pressure on governments to raise revenues. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, we may see unilateral measures whereby there's a minimum global tax imposed by countries or regions. So I think those are that's something significant to consider as well. And that's that's an, that's that's an important point, Edel, because you know in in real estate you tend to be very sheltered from you know from tax due to interest and and depreciation and amortization. So you know any kind of minimum tax is going to have a significant impact. You know we, we've seen press reports about 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 the president's ability to minimize his tax through a combination of things and and part of that is obviously you know amort depreciation and amortization so a minimum tax would have a significant adverse impact to to the real estate industry no i think i mean great perspectives uh, dan and heddle um you know and, and i've really appreciated having the two of you join me today and, and Laurel as well. I think painting the picture for us um, on what the US market, what the outlook is as we enter sort of the close of the fourth quarter and then into 2020. 21 has been invaluable. Obviously, it's tumultuous times. Our, our clients are trying to do their best. We're trying to do our best in advising them accordingly. Um, I hope that everybody has enjoyed this session and um, you, the, you enjoy the remaining sessions left uh, at the conference and certainly we're, uh, we're available uh, at the ready. We're all sort of from home in, in many respects, um, but certainly uh, again, thank you for your time and, and, and tuning in with us for this session and stay safe with uh, your families. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.